Euripides way back when. He's a, he's a naughty little subversive thing. I think you'll enjoy him. He's, he's full of laughs. But um, I wanted to open the talk with opening the floor. I don't want this to be just me as a talking head, kind of yakking at the audience because how boring, right? Um, so I wanted to open the floor again, and I wanted to ask you as the audience, do you remember, and when did you first hear of Helen or the Helen story? Do you remember? Do you want to share? Was it a movie? Was it a book? Was it stories? Was it, where did you first hear of Helen? You remember? Phrase. Face, was that? The face that launched a thousand ships before I even knew anything. Very before good. So was it in English like, class? Do you know? I don't even know where, but it was like in the vernacular. It's just so in, kind of it's cultural osmosis. Right. Alright, so who knows anything about that phrase? Do you know where it came from? Who's heard of this phrase? I don't know heard of this phrase. <laughs> yes, you raise your hand. Something to say. It's not in the Odyssey, but it's about someone who's in it, right? It is about Helen. That's actually from um, Christopher Marlowe. And he was a contemporary of William Shakespeare, right? And he wrote a play uh, about Dr. Faustus, right? Famously made the deal with the devil. And in it had referred to Helen um, when he saw the ghost of Helen rise up from the depths and said, is, is this the face that launched the thousand ships and, you know, the topless towers of Ilium. So good. So there, there's that cultural osmosis. Did you know it was Christopher Marlowe or just a phrase? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there you go. So you've heard of this phrase, Helen. What else? Who else? Don't be sure. Yes. I think there was a Star Trek episode about Helen. Alan of Troyes. Yes. yes. <laughs> do, what do you remember about that? Um, there was a god and uh, Came to find, and she was a crew person on the, on the in the original. Um, this is the original '60s. Yeah. Yeah, with uh, with Captain she Kirk. Was very beautiful, and she fell in love with God, but mm -hmm. he was he wanted to keep the, the the Enterprise crew for his to be his adorers forever. Oh, that's the one with Apollo. <laughs> Apollo. That's the that's Apollo one. one. There is another episode that's more about Helen per se. You're thinking about the Apollo one. Oh, sorry. No, that's fine. I love that episode. <laughs> yeah. uh, someone else. I'll happily talk about Star Trek on a Sunday morning. Uh, someone else. Where do you hear about Helen? you remember? Helen, my beauty is to me like something or other. Yes. From uh, Poe, isn't it? Poe did write a love poem about Helen, which surprises people who don't read a lot of Poe. Right? It's not just Cask of Amontillado. It's actually a very romantic poem about beauty and the transcendence of beauty. Good? What else? Where have you met Helen before? Because I know you've heard of her before today. I'm not introducing you to Helen. Yes? From Art History, The Judgment of Paris. The Judgment of Paris? Do you have a particular one in mind? Oh, there are many things. You have a favorite? There's one by Lucas Kana. It is very weird. Yes, it's, the, the figures are, are yeah, all oh distorted? Yeah, they're, they're sort of like pinups, really, mm -hmm. seriously. Uh, they're supposed to be beautiful, but they're very contorted and, um, yeah. Not, they're supposed to be beautiful, but they're not attractive. So, yeah, there's some subjectivity in it, right? It was kind of good. So, you got it in art history with the judgment of Paris, right? Helen's surprise. What else? What else? Where have you met Helen before? Yes? With like Homer's Iliad? Oh, no, Homer's Iliad. Oh, in the Iliad, yes. And I heard of like Alexander the Great, the mm -hmm. Regent. And it's a thing called Alexander the Great. Yeah, Alexander the Great always had a copy of Homer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Western literature is in the Iliad. Who else? Where did you first meet Helen? Do you remember? Or do you have a favorite version of Helen? Since we're talking about versions of Helen. You know, the more you talk, the less I talk. <laughs> yes, Nicole! There's the Diana Kruger version in Troy. I'm Brad waiting Pitt. for someone to talk about Brad Pitt! <laughs> right, Brad Pitt, 2004. Diane Kruger, German supermodel turned face that launched a thousand movie tickets. 
<laughs> what strikes you about that version? Why that one? Uh, well, we didn't cast it, this person that we you know, often think of as, as mm -hmm. being kind of, you know, the face belongs to Thousand Ships, but nobody actually, I don't know, you don't want to actually have to put a face to that. Um, Bingo! Okay, you get the gold star, because that's what I'm driving at, at as part of, part of the, um, no, we did not plan this. Yeah, even though we're old buddies. Um, my point that I was kind of driving at is we talk about Helen as an ideal of beauty. Right? We kind of talked about this with the chronic painting, that something that's supposed to be beautiful uh, doesn't always look the way that you think it should. Right? And then you cast a supermodel, is she the way that you think of Helen? Well, it depends on you, right? Um, actually, right now in the UK, there is a brand new TV show called The Fall of Troy, which is another attempt to put that story on, uh, on the airwaves, and they also cast a German model. Um, so I'm wondering what the story is uh, for, for this. And she's a brunette, very, very dark, as opposed to Diane Kruger, very, very blonde. Uh, so you know, it depends on how casting directors and how the art directors are looking at well, what is Helen supposed to look like. Because here's the thing, the ancient writers and the poets, they never really give you a description. They don't say, per se, um, she had this color eyes, or she had this shape face, or this was the color of her hair. You have descriptions like golden Helen. That doesn't mean she's blonde, it could just mean she's uh, covered in gold, as noble women would have you know, worn these very elaborate outfits. Um, it could mean a metaphorical kind of golden. Um, she's described as having a terrifying beauty, that it's superhuman, uh, of the sense that it would drive men mad, right? That it's beyond the lot of mortals, and because she was so ineffably beautiful, that it would actually drive people crazy. Um, so there's that. I mean, how do you think she looked? I'm curious before I go on. If you were to, say, cast a Helen or draw Helen, how do you think she looked? Because this is very much about subjectivity. Right? But volunteer, there's no wrong answer, right? How do you think Helen looks if you were going to draw Helen? She had good posture. Good posture? <laughs> okay, I better stand up straight up. Okay. Good posture, All right? What else? What else? What's beautiful? She had a, uh, a lot of personality. Okay, what does that mean? What's the personality? <laughs> That's isn't that what people say when um, someone's not that good looking? But you say they have a great good personality. Good. <laughs> oh, that's terrible! <laughs> well, I mean, there's something about her personality that seems to stand out more than her actual description. So her or her her position in the world and what happens to her seems to be more important than what she actually looks like. She's an ideal. She's yeah. a symbol, kind of. She's something that you think about, but maybe you don't invite out for coffee or cocktail. Well, no, you, like everyone's inviting her out. Oh, well then. Yeah. Well, that's true. Okay, good, what else? What do you think Helen looks like? Yes? I would say that she would not wear makeup or jewelry. It would be mm -hmm. very plain, because it's actually her physical natural physical beauty that that is unique because anybody can wear like you know style stylize mm -hmm. so like something inherent yeah right something natural yes i think it wouldn't be exactly what she looked like but really rather the effect that she would have on people okay so that when they perceived her face mm -hmm. they would feel love and accepted and serene in her presence. That she has a kind of power of personality. Yes. Right, a power of presence, okay, I like that. So you think it's not so much about color hair, eyes, what shade of lipstick. Yeah, it's mm. the effect. Okay, the effect of a person. The aura. Okay, good, very good. Someone, someone else. In the back, yes. Like an elegance about her? Explain. What do you mean? An elegance? It's is this about of, posture? I understand. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, um, I guess, a transition between personality and okay. physical appearance. It's like the way you hold yourself and conduct yourself. So it's behavior, also, as yeah. well as just sheer physical looks, right? Okay. Presence. Sarah, please. I think she actually. I mean, now that I listen to what everyone says, 
I think she actually had something wrong with her face. Do <laughs> <laughs> what? Tell, tell me more. Tell me more. Because there's this trend now in supermodels that they're not the most like classically symmetrical faces. They all have some kind of real quirk or difference. Mm -hmm. And that is what really set her apart. Because I think if you, if she just was really, really, really pretty, there are a lot of people like that. Just like those other models that are very interchangeable. So it's a, so, a thousand ships trying to get away? <laughs> <laughs> it was the reason why it was so unique that nobody could really copy it. It was something like that maybe some people would be like put up. And that's like you use the word terrifying. But other people would be like, oh my god, no, that is so amazing that this is what we want to represent our brand. And like, it, it, was, it was so, um, people would remember it. It was so memorable. And then, so that was what really got everybody attached. Interesting. Yes, I like that. I really like that. Yeah. A lot of what people are saying are reminding me of, uh, and I was trying to think of like an Italian uh, beauty. So I thought of Marissa Tomei, the, the, the female lead from My Cousin Vinny. Oh, yeah, no, she, she's yeah, still yeah. working. She was yeah. awesome. She was, she was very good at My Cousin Vinny. So you she, think it's that kind of quirky? A, she had such a powerful. Uh, Personality on on the on film, and, uh -huh. and she had the great like amazing hair, it was big Italian hair, big Italian attitude. Uh -huh. Big Italian attitude. So I'm, I'm hearing things about okay, of course. And she was a big. Well, yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. And I thought so, she was a car mechanic. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you get all sorts of different. I'm, I'm hearing all sorts of very different, kind of contradictory and yet complementary. Oh, sorry. Yes. Well, in contrast to that, why have I always had an image of Helen as blonde? Where does that come as from? As what? Blonde. Where does that come from? You tell me! I don't know. I'm wondering if that, <laughs> did that come from? Is there a tradition of that? Or is that uh, her standing out amidst the, you know, dark-haired, more dark-complexioned peoples of the Mediterranean? I don't know. I don't know either, because the description is not necessarily, you know, always blonde hair. Okay. Right? I, I mean, I don't know. Well, in many ways. We may also, since we're living here and now, have that kind of filter. We live in a post Marilyn Monroe age. So in some ways, we filter through the bombshells that we know, right? Uh, big bombshells that we know. So those are all sorts of elements. In, oh, sorry, go ahead. Isn't she part, wasn't she a goddess? Or a She's half. half. She's no. half goddess, um, no, half god. Not. Her father was Zeus. Yeah. That's why her beauty is supernaturally well, that's, intense. That's what I was going yeah. to say. You know, maybe she looks for, for everyone. She looks like their ideal. Wouldn't that be a gift <laughs> or a curse? Maybe it could be too popular, right? So these are all elements going into Helen, and I haven't even gotten to the talk. Which is about different versions of her story because we're too busy talking about different versions, right, of Helen. Which I think is very interesting from a kind of narrative perspective. Like, who do you think Helen is? You, right? Or who do you think she isn't? Uh, you know, how do you think a Helen should behave? Because there are lots and lots and lots of different Helens just to begin with. And that's not even going into different versions of stories about Helen. And I wanted to throw that out there um, as a kind of prelude to our production, because the production is about Euripides' version of a version of a version <laughs> of a Helen story. Okay? Now, the earliest version, shall we say, of Helen that we got is from Homer's Iliad, the earliest real evidence in terms of the literature. And in it, she is at Troy. She's gone to Troy, she's run off with Orlando Bloom, and she regrets it 10 years later. She's a very conflicted character from the get-go in Homer's Iliad, where she says, I, um, I did this thing, and I left my family, and I left my child, Hermione, I left all my friends, and, and she has a moment later where she says to Paris, I don't really respect you. Yes, you are incredibly hot, but your brother's a better man. Uh, so domestic troubles uh, in the parents' household. Um, but the, at the same time, she's a very fascinating, conflicted, complicated character. And the beauty is a problem. I mean, the phrase of dangerous beauty. Before I get too far afield, though, some of you had been talking about quantifiable beauty earlier. So before the thought disappears, um, you may remember Carl Sagan and a couple other scientists from a, a few decades back. They made a joke 
about using the Helen as an actual unit of measurement. Have you heard of the show? <laughs> right? That you need a quantity, a measurable quantity of beauty. If we're gonna, if we're gonna say this, right? Um, and so this is a joke based on a nerds uh, playing with Christopher Marlowe, looking back at Helen. And the joke that Sagan and his buddies, and this started making the rounds uh, in, the, in the 80s, is a Helen is the amount of beauty necessary to launch 1,000 ships. Right? <laughs> Therefore, you can use the Helen as a unit of measure attached to any woman. Right? Um, if you have enough beauty just to launch a single ship, then you rate as a Millie Helen. Millie Helen, right? <laughs> and so on. Right? But you're just hoping you don't get, uh, a, and the joke remains Nano that, Helen. that if you get a woman who is multiple Helens worth of beauty, the planet would explode. <laughs> right? That there's only so much beauty uh, that you can handle as human. So you know, then you get the Iliad, and in it, that is the first and arguably the most famous version that she physically went to Troy, right? And a lot of the iterations of the story and other painters and poets and you know, movie makers afterwards have taken on this stance. Uh, she physically goes. And there it is, there, there's, uh, there's Brad Pitt, right, I didn't get her back. Uh, she's actually there, uh, the BBC, Fall of Troy. She is actually at Troy, having various issues, and this is very much about soap opera. That's the, that's the early version. The version that we're actually working with is um, an alternate version that said Helen herself, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the backstory, is that Helen herself never actually went to Troy. It was a fake Helen, you know, that went to Troy, a phantom. Right, um, an idol on an image made of a cloud and given the ability to speak and act like a human. And this brings up all sorts of sci-fi associations about artificial intelligence and what's the nature of humanity and, and sentience and things like that. But that's the other version, that the Helen that went to Troy was not the real Helen at all. That the actual Helen was in Egypt this entire time. Right, waiting for Menelaus, and she never betrayed him uh, that uh, this was a whole other side story. And the most famous incident of it early in Greek uh, literature is by, uh, by a, a poet named Stasichorus. And I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that most of us are not Stasichorus fans, right? You know, that's okay. There's not much of him left to read. But he famously had a poem known as the Palino which means a, a recantation, that you take something back. And he said that he wrote a poem in which Helen uh, went to Troy and did all the stuff. But that Helen, after death, had become a goddess, and that she was not pleased with this version of the story, that she showed up and struck him blind for his presumption in saying that she had done this thing. And that in order to get a sight back, he had to write a recantation in which he said, oh, no, 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 that never happened. And it's fragmentary, but this is how it starts out. This is not the true tale, he says. You never went in the well-bent ships. You did not go to the towers of Troy. And you know, please let me have my eyes on you. <laughs> and according to this version, this narrative, the divine Helen, um, was moved by his apology and gave him his sight back because he took back that story. He said, you never did this. But he also says, well, you know, Homer never took it back, and that's why Homer's still blind. Because <laughs> right? Homer's supposed to be famously the blind poet. Uh, so that's one version. Uh, the, the version, the, the Homeric version, that she went, and then this ongoing attempt to correct Homer or change that tradition or add another tradition to Sycorus saying, oh, this never happened. You yourself never went. So that's one version. Herodotus uh, said that he went to Egypt and found a story told by the Egyptian priests that when Paris and Helen had left Greece and were on their way to Troy, they ended up in Egypt and that uh, the Egyptian king was horrified at this horrible thing that they had done and set Paris on his way and kept Helen safe in Egypt 
waiting for the return of her husband, Menelaus. So again, an attempt to correct Homer. Then you get to, I'm running short on time, um, but then we get to Euripides, our poet du jour, right? Fifth century BC Athens, he's the last of the three great dramatists who wrote tragedy, and in some ways he's the, he's the rubble of the watch, right? He's a, he's a little naughty, he's a little subversive, he likes to shake things up. And within a span of three years, he wrote two plays about Helen, and guess which tradition he wrote? Both of them, that's right. Uh, so that's, the, that's my point, is that you know, these two traditions, two major traditions, are running around competing, but also complementing each other. And it's entirely possible to tell both stories at the same time and be completely legitimate about it. Right, Euripides around 415 BC, I have to correct me if I'm wrong, it is 415, Church and Women, 415. And Helen is 412. So in a span of three years, he wrote two very different plays about two very different Helens. And they're both completely intact, integral dramas in their own right. In Trojan Women, this is Helen who went to Troy physically. She has a debate with the Queen of Troy, Hecuba, after the fall of the city, where she defends herself and says, I take no responsibility for what I did. It's not me. She does not deny that she's at Troy. She's there. So it's a completely different Helen. And then in 412, you get this Helen, which dramatizes in fine fashion the other story, where she never went to Troy at all. And the Helen who was there was the phantom, the fake Helen, right? The decoy, uh, the falsehood, an eidolon, which is good Greek for an image, right? A phantom, the phantom menace. I've been waiting all lecture to say that. And no one laughed, <laughs> right? And no one laughed. But that's okay, because you're probably hungry. Uh, so I, I think now's a good time for me to wrap it up. But I did want to throw out there the ideas that it is perfectly okay, and in fact, good practice as uh, patrons of arts and stories to entertain the idea of different Helens with different stories, and you can entertain more than one at the same time, and you probably should. That it makes the storytelling world much more interesting and much more complicated when you can embrace more than one tradition at the same time and so appreciate how your author, in our case Euripides, is playing with the traditions that he knew and playing with you, the audience, because I'm pretty sure he assumes that you know that he knows, that you know, <laughs> that there are lots of different traditions and we're working with all of them at the same time to create a new story for your entertainment. Questions? Phil? Well, uh, everybody seems to have a different idea about how she looks. She answers various things, all plausible. This play has no difference in understanding how she looks. The play is about how she is. And we get that from the get-go with her encounter for, of this wandering Greek Tusser, who will apologize to her for having been rude. But he knows exactly how she looks, the messenger from the ship's crew. Mm -hmm. they, he knows how she looks, but they don't, they don't, they don't how know she how she is. Mm -hmm. That's what this play is about. A real play of recognition to a character. Very good. Questions, comments? Something add? I laughed. Oh, I, I acknowledge that. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Anyone else? Over there. Yeah. This is, this is Michael. It's not as relevant to the play, but are there other instances of an Edelon in, in myth? Or is this the no, there are a couple other ones. Ixion famously attempted to assault Hera, um, but he was given an idol on of Hera instead, so he assaulted that. And according to one version of this myth, that's where centaurs came from. That's why they're always lusty and violent, because they were born out of a lusty, violent beginning. Yeah. Yes? I have a question about Helen. Did she go of her own free will, or was she kidnapped? It depends. Ooh, Who's weird. telling the story? It depends on who's telling the story. So the answer is yes. <laughs>
Anyone else? Well, I think the house should be open. It is 2 o'clock. So thank you.